I managed to grab one of the LED flashlights that goes with the Parkside or little um, 12 volt battery system. So you snap the battery in and I was expecting maybe to have multiple intensities. No, it's literally a click on, click off switch. And the power dissipation of this is at 12 volts, 114 milliamps, so it's 1.4 watts, 9 volts, 125 milliamps, 1.1 watt, and at 6 volts, just before it cuts out, although it would cut out earlier with the battery uh, protective circuitry, it was measuring 164 milliamps at 1 watt, so roughly 1 to 1.5 watts. It's not really pushing this uh, typical 1 to 3 watt style LED too hard. It does have a battery indicator when it's on, it's a very faint battery indicator. You can't even see the battery indicator. Let's zoom down this a little bit. Can you see the battery indicator there? Super faint, and it is just passive LEDs and resistors and uh, zeners or something like that because it does gradually fade out as you turn the voltage down because I put it on the bench power supply to find out. Okay, enough of that. Let's unplug the battery and open it up, noting that there is a staple in here to actually grip this end of the case together. Fairly common in some power tools. Very annoying because it's usually quite hard to get out. Other than that, there are what appear to be five screws. So we'll take the screws out. Then I'll attempt to get that staple out. Can't tell how easy it's going to come out. I don't know if it latches in. I'd expect it to have some sort of latching effect. I was kind of expecting this to have a clicky button with the multiple intensity settings. On a plus note, because it's not got active electronics, it means that the it's not going to pose that slight quiescent current draw on the battery. Not that there is much of a quiescent current draw. The battery itself has active circuitry in it. I've opened those before, and it's got charge control circuitry built in, and also the over-discharge protection. This screw is the one that's going to be a nuisance. It's trying to push the case apart. Or is that the staple that's kind of doing that? Not sure. Yeah, this is not coming apart easily. Right, tell you what, let's take a look at the staple. I shall get another screwdriver and I shall try and push that staple up. That ain't happening. That ain't happening either. It does look as though it's kind of splayed out, so I wonder if there's a locking mechanism. Is it being not being helped with the fact that that should maybe help it? But the fact it is splayed apart by that screw that has decided to grip on the way out. Mm, this isn't promising. This does look as though it's uh, in quite tight. Long nose pliers. Let's grab it and pull it. This is not coming out easily. Let's Try beefier pliers. This is probably making loud popping, clicking noises with the effort to get it apart. The microphone sometimes exaggerates the pops and clicks because it can't really react in time. How are we doing? Do we still have to get this screw out? This has not gone well, has it? But that, this is a real teardown. It's not rehearsed in any way. Right. So this comes apart. And reveals, oh, there's a fair amount, all the circuitry's in one board. So there's the clicky switch, there's an inductor, there is a little chip hiding under there. They've helpfully put goo under it, which is good from a stream leaf perspective, but terrible from a reverse engineering perspective. Okay, right, tell you what, I'll take a picture of this, and then we can explore it and see what's involved. One moment, please. Reverse engineering is complete. Let's explore. And I got deja vu. Ask me you if you saw the recent MR16 teardown video because it's very similar circuitry. It appears to be a LED driver chip designed for 12 volt type systems, which makes sense given this is powered by 12 volts. Here's a switch. It's a straight on off switch. Uh, there is a smoothing capacitor across the output just for stability of the circuit. We have the switching chip, it's little 47 microhenry inductor. We have a snubber across the inductor to zero volt, uh, actually kind of across the inductor and the switch in the chip, presumably for protection. Uh, 20 ohm resistor and capacitor. We have the center resistors that set the current through the LED and we have the little flyback diode, the freewheel diode that actually makes the circuit much more efficient. The rest of the circuitry over here is uh, just purely those little red, yellow and green 
uh, battery status indicators, which are very, very primitive indeed. Um, you may notice there's a little capacitor hidden under here. Quite tricky to actually even break through this glue. I was trying to remove the glue. This is that horrible sticky glue that does not remove easily. But anyway, let's go straight to their schematic and explore uh, things worth noting. Oh, here are a couple of diode, uh, xenodiodes called WC. That's more or less it. Not an awful lot. Oh, and one last thing. This link here that may be be designed for a position for a ferrite bead or something, although it's not marked as such, but it was in a previous circuit we looked at. Let's get close to this. I'll apologise in advance if that light suddenly goes into disco mode. It's done it twice recently. Just a brief flash. I think the power supply and it's failing probably capacitor. Anyway, here is where the battery connects. There is the on-off switch. There is the 220 microfarad capacitor. Then there is the battery level detection circuit, which is basically... A series of voltage dividers with an LED across one of the divider resistors and then a couple of zeners to actually scale it up. So it has to be quite a high voltage before the green will light, uh, almost the full 12 volts. It's a gallium arsenide, gallium phosphide green. It's the old school green, I think, uh, just provide, to provide a nice, stable, predictable low voltage. Makes it very dim though. Um, Again, we get a zener diode and the divider with different resistor values for the yellow and then for the red, since it's right at the very end of the scale, they've not got the zener diode, it's just straight to uh, a divider with quite a high value resistor here. It's very dim, but I suppose it does the job. Here is the mysterious ET6115 chip. Uh, I found a data sheet for that, but the data sheet literally just had a, a picture of the pinout and that was it. No data. I get the feeling this is a clone of a very standard range of chips. And the circuitry is very standard too. There are two current sense resistors, 0.91 and 0.68 ohm, uh, giving a total in parallel of a 0 0.4 ohms. You can hack this. If you want to reduce the intensity of the LED here, um, theoretically you could uh, modify those resistor values or just chop one out. But having said that, it is only about 1 to 1.5 watts, so it's not that high anyway. There's a little capacitor across it. I measured that as 120 nanowind circuit, but that is not a great way to measure it. And this one also measures 120 nano, which means uh, that, you know, it's not guaranteed that's a good reading off those. They'd have to be taken out of circuit to be measured. The little inductor here was, where is it? 47 micro Henry. 47 micro Henry. And there is a mysterious link component. There's a link in it that could have been for a ferrite bead or it could be a resistor. But there is a shocky diode. And the idea is that when this turns on, current starts flowing through the resistors and through the LED, but it's limited by the building up of magnetic field in this inductor. Once it reaches a certain threshold set by the voltage measured across these resistors, it turns off and the magnetic field collapses and uh, goes the opposite priority and then it actually powers the LED via the collapsing field via this diode for extra efficiency. And this little snubber down here is presumably to protect it against uh, the, the switching device that goes between these connections from damage from the back EMF spike um, it, in the brief moment before this Schottky diode turns on. Things worth mentioning. It uses the standard Luxion Star style LED heatsink with no... Uh, it's got basically it's an LED plate with the high power LED in it, but with no actual extra heatsink. And that's all right in the region of about one watt. It's not too bad. But going higher, it wouldn't be so good. I say Luxion Star. Luxion developed that format and then got ripped off solid by everybody, as the Chinese are wont to do. Uh, other things worth mentioning... Uh, you could change the colour of the LED if you want. You could change it to a infrared LED or a red one if you wanted sort of like that. Uh, I was going to say astrology again. Astronomy, where you don't like, you don't want to affect your vision too much by using a broad spectrum light to use the red. But it would also be very useful with an ultraviolet, uh, the near UV LED, for a mechanic uh, to actually search for leaks with a very pinpointed ultraviolet light because you've got the tracer dyes in refrigerant and uh, coolant. But that is it. The construction is basic, but you know what? Maybe that's a good thing. Most of the circuitry seems to be for the very crude um, battery level indicator. But on the whole, once you've opened it up, there's that horrible little label, this dark 
matte label that obscures the red, green, and blue LEDs. Um, but I'll just stick that there. Uh, but it's kind of openable with a bit of effort, noting that little uh, pin, that little sort of staple here. And it is hackable. It's uh, modifiable. You could change it to warm white LED if you wanted. You can you can hack it in many ways. Um, and that makes it quite useful. Now, I'm guessing that this is not just manufactured for the Parkside brand. I'm guessing it's going to be the same circuitry in many other ones because it seems to become manufacturers that manufacture a lot of these things. But there we have it. This one in particular was the little Parkside 12-volt uh, LED flashlight or torch.